in light of the events that took place yesterday on London Bridge, what I would ask is that we have a minute silence, please. Um, and if we can do that starting from now. And I think that's a good idea, Andy. Why don't we stand? If we can do that now. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Mark McDonald. I'm the parliamentary candidate for Stoke South. Uh, first of all, what I want to do is uh, introduce you to uh, Sakina Sheikh, who's been with us now for the last week and has been an, uh, an excellent uh, uh, addition to our team and actually has been managing us very well and putting us in the right direction. She is a councillor in Lewisham and a climate change activist. She is hopefully behind me, she's here. So I'm just gonna hand over to her for the moment, thank you. I thought I'd get up here so I can see you at the back. How are you guys doing? Yeah? Yes. It's lovely to be here talking to you today. I've had I've fallen in love with the people of Stoke in the last week, I can't lie to you. It's, felt, it's already felt like my second home. You guys are wonderful, you're kind-hearted, and the generosity of your kindness is something that I actually haven't seen anywhere else. So thank you so much for making me feel so welcome and at home. Um, I think the first time I arrived was last week when Jeremy was here. Who saw Jeremy speak? Yay. What do we think of Jeremy? Yay. I have to be honest with you folks, he's the reason I joined the Labour Party. I'm someone who's been politically active my whole life, but it wasn't until I saw a man who's actually stood on the picket lines and stood on the front lines of grassroots campaigning, a man who I know is gentle-hearted and a man who has integrity, and if you look at his voting record, has always been on the right side of history, that I actually see myself and see my identity in the Labour Party. And I have to say, it's been incredible canvassing in places like London and places like here, and meeting people who are so inspired by that man's honesty. And I think that it is without a doubt that he is the the only one to lead a transformative agenda in the future. Now, knocking on doors here at Stoke, I was, you know, before I told a few folk that I was coming up, they were like, oh, that's, that's, um, you know, that's the, the Brexit capital of the UK. But I don't think that it's anything to do with people being, feeling like Brexit is necessarily the right solution. I think it's the fact that when you mention Thatcher on the doorstep, people spit, and as they should do because it's Thatcher that has decimated communities like this, and her legacy lives on. And I think for me it's really clear that, I don't know how the Tories have managed to do it, but they've managed to wash themselves up and rid themselves of that legacy, and they are cut from the same cloth. Boris's Brexit deal, whether you want Brexit or you want Remain, is an extension of exactly what we stood on the front lines fighting Thatcher against, workers' rights, the ability for workers to earn a minimum wage, to have their employment spaces protected, to live and thrive with dignity and joy. And that is what will be diminished if we have a Tory government. So it's so amazing to see each and every one of you out today. Now, you know this better than me. Stoke, I think, epitomises what we're fighting for in this election. This is a seat that should be Labour. When I say to people on the doorstep, Tories have got no business here, no matter how angry they might be at both political parties, they agree with that fact. Because we remember that, we know that Thatcher robbed the mining, um, the mining industries, the pottery industries, all the manufacturing industries of this place of their joy of their livelihood. And actually, it is not a Tory government that's going to put investment back into those communities. It is a green industrial revolution. It is bringing home manufacturing. It is giving back spaces and places like this the joy that they need to flourish. So when I say to people on the doorstep, if we want to save our NHS, if we want to save our workers' rights, if we want education back in our schools, we need a Labour government. But what we need is each and every one of you to come out door knocking. Now, we've seen um, a growth in the 
volunteers that have come every single day. And what I've found as well is most people are just a little bit disorientated with politics. And what they need is they need a friendly labour face. They need someone who says, do you know what, we're listening, we understand you, we're with you and they want to vote Labour. So we need each and every one of you to come out today. And that's why we've got some far more exciting speakers than myself to rile you up. But before we get you to do that, what we did with Jeremy is we got 40, nearly 50 people signed up to do door knocking. And we've been building our team throughout the week, throughout the last weeks, and getting out and chatting to every single person. So what I did then is what I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask you to join me, is I'm going to give you my number, and I'm going to ask you to text me, if you haven't already done this, I can help and your name. Can you show me your phones? <clears throat> All right. 07 93 087 2640. I'm going to give it to you one more time. And what I want you to do is text me right now. I can help. Text me your name. Because if we win seats like Stoke, we can have a Labour government. 75 years this has been a Labour seat. Tories have got no business here. And for the last two years, we've seen someone who really doesn't care about these communities. Now, I know the reason I'm up here from London is because Mark has been working with charities, with communities, with each and every one of you to win this seat back for Labour. But we need every single one on the doorstep. Thank you so much. I've already had the text. We're going to go one more time. 07. Thank you very much, Andy. 93. 087. 2640. Thank you very much, Jamie. And let's get you in a WhatsApp group and let's get out and win this seat. Do we think we can win this seat for Labour, folks? Yes. Do we think we can save our NHS? Yes. Do we think we can restore workers' rights? Yes. Can we bring manufacturing back to Stoke? Yes. Will the Tories deliver it? No. Are we going to get them out? Yes. Amazing. Yes. Now, over to John, to Mark, and to Owen. I want anyone who's got number one to put their hand up. You were given a number when you came in. Who's got number one? You guys are going to be with Joe. Who's going to be canvassing with us afterwards? Everyone, everyone. Who can give me 20 minutes after this for canvassing? That's everyone. So everyone who's got a number, I can feel you texting me as well. Thank you. Number one, you guys are going to be with Joe. Joe, come up. Grab him. So if you've got number one, come and find this gentleman afterwards and you're going to go and knock on doors and help us win the seat back for Labour. Put your hand up if you've got number two. I can only see, yeah, brilliant. Hannah, you're going to come and find this person here. Her name's Hannah. Number twos are going to be with Hannah. We're going to do door knocking with Hannah. Who's got number three? Brilliant. You're going to be with Fliss. Fliss, put your hand up. You're going to come and find Fliss. Number four, who's got four? Fantastic. Four is, who's number four on there? Four is Joe as well. Yes, oh, so you, you, you are one and four. Am I? Yeah, one and four. So four is also with Joe. You didn't know that, he knows that now. And who's got five? Brilliant. Phil? I'm here. Hello. This is Phil, if you've got number five, you're gonna be with Phil. And number six? You're going to be with Nathan. Where's Nathan? Nathan's over there. You're going to be number six. Guys, I really, really believe 650 votes. We can win the seat back for Labour. And it sends a huge message to the Tory party that they've shifted so far from the right that even Thatcher would blush if she saw them. They've got no place running our country. They're pathological liars. They started austerity. It means that in places like Lewisham, I'm choosing between children's mental health services and the elderly care. And that's inhumane decisions. They've normalised cruelty and they've normalised an expectations that our politicians can lie. That's why Boris can stand up again and again and tell blatant lies. That's why his team can lie to the BBC about whether he will or won't do an interview. They have corrupted the political culture of what can be a beautiful and honest, empowering democratic process. So we say Tories out, Labour in. Let's win Stoke back and let's restore dignity back into our communities. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I think it's my turn. So I'm not going to stand on the chair. I think I might fall off. Uh, so I think you can see me. Uh, I, I want to pick up uh, from where uh, Sakina uh, talked about 
you know, about her feelings about Stoke. I was here a few months ago. I have this. I feel the same way about Stoke. But I also feel that the anger uh, and frustration that so many people in Stoke clearly feel is very justified, and it's justified because Stoke and other places similar to Stoke uh, have been ignored by governments. Let's face it, governments of all parties, not just the Tory party. And that is a shame on us. And we've got to do something about that. We've got to put that right. Because when we were in government, though we, in, in, last time, though we did a number of good things, we utterly failed to realise the extent to which markets have completely failed so many people in this country. The rigour of competition, a phrase which shamefully still appears in our rule book as a party, does not work for so many working class people in this country and especially, and especially in Stoke. It doesn't work for industry. It doesn't work to create the jobs that we need, secure jobs, well-paid jobs, skilled jobs. It doesn't work for our public services. Competition doesn't work for healthcare. It doesn't work to create decent, affordable housing for people. It doesn't work to maintain workers' rights, trade union rights. Trade unions have been the things that have kept, for, for most of the last century, workers' rights improving, pay, real pay improving. And the destruction, or the attempt to destroy, the trade union movement by Thatcher and the Tories that follow is what has led to the situation where so many people in this country, the, actually the majority of this country, seeing their incomes fall in real terms, even if they were lucky enough to be in work. And it's seen people who are in work, who are working really hard, still suffering from, well, to begin to suffer and now increasingly suffer from poverty in work, dependent far too often on food banks when they are working many, many hours every week. The, the answer to this is not tinkering. It is fundamental change. We need a government that is going to invest to create jobs, to, to take the responsibility to invest, to, to create jobs, in, to, uh, to create jobs, to restore those rights that have been uh, destroyed, to restore pay, to, 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 in, to ensure that pay rises in real terms, not falling in real terms, to rise to the challenge of climate change and climate uh, emergency and to use it as an opportunity to create green, sustainable jobs. The tinkering won't work, and that's why our manifesto doesn't promise tinkering. It does promise fundamental change, because nothing else will work. Now, Sakina referred to Thatcher and the damage that she did, and I, you know, I was still a student when uh, I stayed up on all night in 1979 and uh, Thatcher won that election. Uh, so, you know, my life has been, you know, I'm a child of Thatcher in a sense, or a uh, that was my, my formative years. And she did start uh, the process of destruction of industry. She did break trade union power, begin to break trade union power in this country. She did begin privatisation. But there's also something that she did which we need to learn from. You know, it talks in our rule book, in our, in our, in, in our, uh, you know, in clause four, of a fundamental and irreversible change. Thatcher, unfortunately, made a fundamental, and I hope not quite, but very, but very hard uh, to reverse changes in this country. They did it by, not only by privatising, uh, by selling council houses, uh, you know, by destroying industry that, 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 that were well unionised industries with, with security and decent pay, they did it by, through privatisation and council house sales, giving a number of people, a significant number of people, a stake in the changes that she made. And that's how she made those changes. 
uh, what, what have been for a long time fundamental and irreversible. And we have got to do the same thing. And that is what our manifesto is set out to do. Would you trust Boris Johnson to invest in Britain's future? No. no. I don't trust him at all. Absolutely. Would you trust him to take on vested interests and speculators? I don't trust him at all. That's quite right. The only job that Boris Johnson is going to get done is to look after the privileged few. Yeah. So what's our job in this? Our job is to make that fundamental and irreversible change happen. And what you can do about that today is to get out there and knock on a few doors. And so I hope I didn't see everybody's hand in the room go off. Can I really appeal to all of you to take on that responsibility of making the fundamental and irreversible change, which people in Stoke desperately need, as we all know. <laughs> now I want to introduce you to the next person who's got a big responsibility <laughs> for, for, for making these change happen, and that's Mark McDonald, who I hope will be, before Christmas, on December the 13th, your MP for this constituency. Yeah. I'm not going to keep you too long because really we want to hear from also from Owen uh, today. But I want to tell you really two things. First, what, why it is that I want to be a member of Parliament. And secondly, the experiences that I've had here in Stoke which have made me angry and it should make all of us angry. What, why do I want to be an MP? I started off working in the National Health Service. I worked in a &E, worked in a &E under Thatcher. I started working in 1982 in casualty and later in the operating theatre. I saw then hospitals close down. I saw nurses losing their jobs. I saw the creeping privatisation of the health service. I saw old people on trolleys because we did not have enough beds for them. I saw rating lists grow and grow where sometimes people died before they actually had the operation that they so urgently needed. And it made me angry that I wanted to do something, that I wanted to ensure that never again will the Conservatives be in charge of our health service. And we had a Labour government that poured money into the health service and changed it. Now, I didn't agree with everything that they did, but they certainly changed a whole structure of the health service to ensure that people got operations when they needed them, that rating lists were decreased, that we had nurses. And right now, where are we? We're back to where we were under Thatcher. I was up at the Royal the other day and I saw a packed A&E department and a rating list that for, to just see a doctor that was going on for hours. I spoke to one mother that had her child with her. They'd arrived at six o'clock that evening because she was ill, she couldn't get a GP, and later she was seen by a doctor at 5 a.m. That cannot be right. That can never be right, that you sit there with your child for hours on end, simply to see a doctor. We have to change. We have to change. And the only way we can change is with a Labour government. The only way we can save our National Health Service, and let's get it right, we're, we're at that brink right now, because if they continue, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. The only way we're going to save our National Health Service is with a Labour government. And it starts right here, ensuring that we get rid of a useless Conservative MP and we get a Labour MP. Because it's about the numbers to ensure that we have a Labour government. And this is our fight right here. You are part of that fight. But why Stoke? Now you all know, because you all experience Stoke, you live here, you've grown up here, you know the issues of Stoke. But let me tell you the two things that I've seen whilst being here. The first is this. It's the effects of PIP. Those who don't know it, which is the Assessment for Disability Benefits. 
I was speaking to a, a local activist who had been working on helping people who had been refused the disability benefit, in essence. And this man had, uh, um, had problems, couldn't work. And he'd been refused his benefits, and it was wrong. The decision was wrong. So this young community activist got involved, got his appeal, got to a tribunal. 24 hours before the tribunal, he died of the lung cancer that prevented him from working. He died. This government said he was fit to work with a terminal illness of lung cancer. That's where we are. And the second is this. We have second 17 food banks in Stoke, and it's increasing. It's not decreasing. We have 17. Last summer, 8,500 families had to be fed by a charity so their children can have a warm dinner. I was in a food bank about a year and a half ago, and I was with the person who was running the food bank, and he was telling me the structure and how things worked in that particular food bank. Actually, it's five minutes walk from here. It's at, uh, um, at Temple Street Methodist Church. You'll know it. I saw a couple coming with two young children, about this age, two girls. He had been uh, uh, laid off. He was sick. He was on a zero hours contract. He was sick and he couldn't go to work. So he didn't get paid. His benefits hadn't kicked in under the universal credit. Hadn't started. <laughs> she had just been made redundant. She had a part-time job and she'd been made redundant. They had no money. And I saw as two plastic bags of food were carried out and given to the family. And at the top of the bag was a box of corn cakes. And I saw these two children's eyes light up because they saw food. It, it doesn't, shouldn't just make me angry. It should make us all angry. It should make us all angry that we live in a society where children need charity to feed themselves. The only way we can change this, we have two weeks, two weeks, for you to help me get elected. So I hope that you'll do that, not just today, but you'll come back and you'll help me whenever you can to get out there. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because when we go out there and we knock on those doors, yeah, you're going to get people who are going to say, oh, I'm not going to vote Labour. So be it. And they may never vote Labour. But there are lots of people out there that have been sucked in by these Daily Mail and Daily Express headlines. When you start having a conversation with them, they change their minds. And that only happens when we talk to them. There are 40,000 residential houses. And there's a few of us. But there's more of you. So please help me, please help us win. Thank you. I should have introduced you to Owen James. There you go. Um, it is good to be back in the People's Republic of Stoke. Now, are we fired up? Yeah. Are we going to kick out the Tories? Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to get a brilliant Mark elected? Yeah. Are we going to hear those magic words? Stoke on Trent South, Labour gain. Yes. Louder. Yes. And are we going to bring down Boris Johnson? Yes. And are we going to get a socialist government to transform society forever? Yes. Well, we can all go home then, can't we? Yes. Now, I just want to say something quickly about yesterday. I was at London Bridge yesterday in the immediate aftermath of the attack. And it is important we don't just, of course, we have to remember those who were murdered by a terrorist. And we should also remember the courage of those who tackled him not knowing if he had a genuine suicide vest on. One was a guy called Lukasz, a Polish chef, who charged at that terrorist. And what we're doing here today, and everyone across the country actually, whoever they're campaigning for, is an act of defiance. 
because terrorists want to interfere and meddle with our democracy and leave us scared and cowed. And by campaigning here today, we are fighting for a democracy in defiance of what those terrorists did yesterday, and we should all be very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in, imagine, imagine this scene. It's the early hours of the 13th of December. Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg are, are, are perched over a television screen. They go a ghostly white. Jacob Rees-Mogg looks roughly the same. And then Jacob Rees-Mogg says something pretentious in Latin, which roughly translates as, oh, bugger. And that is the moment that they see those magic words, Stoke-on-Trent, Labour gain, South that is, and that will be down to the campaigning and activism and dedication of all the people in this room. All of us, every single one of us. Now, the Tories have quite a few advantages, you've probably noticed. Most... Most of the press outlets are acting as their official, unofficial campaigning organisations. They have hedge funds and banks and multi-billionaires and tax dodgers who are financing them, who are sustaining them. But they don't have this. They don't have hundreds of thousands of people in the biggest political party in Western Europe full of hope and full of optimism. And we know that hope and that optimism is contagious that we take it to every single community and every single doorstep. And what it does is it ends people's sense of resignation, which is how this broken social order has always sustained itself. There is no alternative drummed into the minds of an entire generation. And that spell is broken when a message of hope and optimism is taken to communities like this. Now, we've heard about how Thatcherism tried to rip the heart out of communities like this though never achieved ripping away their souls. The destruction of skilled, properly paid jobs and work as those industries were ravaged, leaving so much despair in their wake. And in the last decade, this is what they've done, and we should remember what they've done. The longest squeeze in wages of any industrialised country other than Greece. A country in which most people in poverty are in working households, earning their poverty. A country, as we've heard, one of the wealthiest nations that has ever existed, where people are unable to satisfy the most basic human need of all other than breathing and drinking, to eat hundreds of thousands driven to food banks, including in communities like this, many of them little kids who turn up to their schools with empty bellies. A society now where child poverty is projected to be at its highest rate in six decades. An entire generation, again, robbed of so much potential, and with it the potential of the entire country as well. Where kids grow up in overcrowded homes, where the council housing that was sold off was not replaced, and so many are driven into rip-off, unregulated, private rented sector without security, unable to set down roots with their families. A society in which more older people freeze to death in their homes at twice the rate as Finland. A society where people lie awake at night, staring at the ceiling, panicking about unopened energy bills on their kitchen table. But what this election should be about is this. This is a society with all the wealth and all the resources and all the talent to overcome every single injustice and every single challenge. We're just being held back by a government which serves the interests of its literal paymasters, the vested interests, who plunge this country into crisis after crisis, walk away whistling as Muslims and migrants and refugees and benefit claimants and disabled people are demonized and castigated and forced to pay for a crisis they have absolutely nothing to do with. And that message of fear, and that's what it is, because what this Society, this broken social order, rigged in favour of those vested interests is based on, is the sense of the politics of fear that, that you resign to injustice, like it's the weather, which we will be complaining about a lot in the coming days, to say the least, that you just have to grit your teeth and take the blows. But the entire basis of our cause is based on the politics of hope, which is the idea that every injustice is temporary and transient and can be overcome with enough determination, enough resilience and enough solidarity. And let's think about what we're fighting for. We're fighting for a society where the wealth that is created 
by the collective hard effort and graft of millions of people, instead of just ending up locked in the pockets and onshore and offshore bank accounts of the super elite, should be taxed properly and fairly so we can invest it in education, so we can invest it in an NHS, which now has record A&E waiting lap times, which was plunged into what the British Red Cross called a humanitarian crisis. That instead of most people earning their poverty, that we should, no ifs, no buts, however old or young people are, have a genuine living wage to support them and their families. That instead of punishing young people for daring to dream to a university education from which all of society benefits by saddling them with debt, that we fund education with progressive taxation. That instead of utilities being run like rail and energy and gas as cash cows for profiteers, they should be brought back the whole lot under the democratic public ownership of the people of this country. That instead of the climate emergency being something which poses an existential threat to human existence, that we see it as an opportunity to have a Green New Deal that will create hundreds of thousands of skilled jobs, not least in communities like this, where so many of those jobs were ripped apart. The renewable energy of the future, the mass insulation of homes across the country, taking on fuel poverty as well as a climate emergency. Public transport that's actually affordable and decent so people don't have to be forced out into cars or forced to fly in their own country, which can, or, or, or it's where it's cheaper to fly to other countries than to travel by train in your own country. All of these are within our grasp. They're not impossible. They're not far-fetched, they're just basic common sense in a society with all the wealth and all the means to do all of this and a lot more. Now this is how I always end and it's absolutely critical. And it's important to remember this because the last week and a half are going to be tough. It's going to be vicious and ugly and bitter. The polling, and we need to be careful, with polling you're neither complacent nor defeatist. The polling has shifted in Labour's favour, and it's, it's edging higher in a way that the Tories did not expect. And they are worried, and that is, by the way, down to people campaigning, knocking on doors, talking to their mates, their families, ex-lovers, who knows, people on bus stops, <laughs> using online to spread messages and all the rest. It is working, but it'll be ugly. So what I always remember is this at times when things are difficult and hard, is to remember how change happens. That the way we win our rights and freedoms isn't through the goodwill and generosity of the powerful, but through the struggle and determination of people from below. You know, the powerful didn't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm feeling generous today, I'll give women the vote for a laugh. People had to fight at huge cost and huge sacrifice. Like the early trade unionists who fought for the rights and freedoms and security of working people. Like the Chartists of the 19th century, who fought for working people to have a say over their own country. Like those who gathered at St. Peter's Field in 200 years ago. Men, women, children who were massacred by the state fighting for democracy. Like suffragettes who now are lauded as secular saints, but in their time reviled and hated as terrorists and anarchists. Dragged from demonstrations, thrown into dirty cells, tubes forced down their noses. Those who fought for the NHS and the welfare state in the teeth of what seemed like overwhelming opposition. Like those who fought racism, homophobia, sexism, battened, spat at, demonised, hated. We stand on the shoulders of giants. All our rights, all our freedoms, won no doubt by people in this room. By our mothers, our fathers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers and our ancestors before them. And we owe it to them. Not just to defend the rights and freedoms they won at such cost, at such sacrifice, but to finish the battle that they started, which is to build a new society free of exploitation, injustice, oppression, racism and violence. And we can do that. That's why we're here. That's our mission. It's a, it's a baton pass from generation to generation. And the, the history of social change it's not victory after uh, victory, victory after victory. It's often defeat, setback, defeat, setback, and then victory. And it was hard and lonely for so many of our ancestors when they fought for the rights and freedoms that we have today. And they fought far greater odds than we have. But they did win. And we have to have that same courage, that same determination, and that same resilience. We are up 
against a formidable enemy, which has the most powerful people and interests in this country in their favour. But we have this. We have a mass movement brimming with hope and optimism. So what we're going to do today is we are going to take that hope, we're going to take that optimism, we're going to take it to this community, we're going to get this guy elected, we're going to kick out the Tories, and we're going to build a new democratic socialist society, to coin a phrase, run in the interest of the many and not the few. So let's have that courage, let's have that determination, let's have that resilience, and let's win this battle. Yeah. Let's do it. by the way. Oh, I forgot to call out seven. Seven is with Andy. Andy, can you stand up? Turn around. Number seven. Let's, right. Let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, all right. Let's. Put down no, no, it's all right. So number seven's with Andy. And who didn't have a number? Okay. I have number one, but I can't find we'll, we'll, he we'll help you find number one, Andy. All right. Whoever hasn't got a number, you're going to be with Andy in number seven, because I only saw two other hands. Guys, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or one hour, please stick around and knock on a few doors. If we have three conversations each that turn to Labour, we'll win the seat. And that is what we're here.